Good morning, Revolution. Scott, what's up with you? Uh, not a lot. I'm happy. Weather's nice here, and even when I, you know, have to stay inside a lot of the time, it just feels easier doing it in nice weather. Um, you know, you know that's right. You know that's right. You know, I was thinking about Good Morning uh, uh, Revolution yesterday, and it reminded me of my uh, uh, mother because I would I would either say that to her. Or I would ask her, uh, Mom, are you ready for the revolution? And so she would either say, I am, but I don't know who else is. <laughs> and, uh, and then sometimes uh, I would say, Ma, are you ready for the revolution? And she would say, well, Joe, you know, there are two kinds of revolutions. You know, one is going around in circles. <laughs> and the other is going forward, the implication being that I was going around in circles, you know what I'm saying? Well, let's, uh, yeah. let's try to keep ourselves going forward. Yeah, it's a spiral. Yeah. A spiral. Yep. The dialectic is, is yep. a spiral. Trump has us going around in circles. The boy went to Michigan, was it, yesterday? And uh, again, refused to wear a mask. I think he wore one in private. But mm. then when he went out in the public, he... Uh, uh, macho man, you know, um, he's a macho, macho man. He didn't, he refused to put one on, you know, and uh, what a bad signal these boys are sending to everybody, you know, it's uh, really I, dangerous. I, I have no idea why, yeah, well, what the, well, actually I do, I do know what it is and you were, you were right on, or at least in part, you were right on with the, um, the macho man idea. Um, so much of the right wing response to this has been uh, conditioned by a kind of male supremacy and misogyny that, you know, that equates um, being in danger and, and being, you know, heedless of your safety and others' safety with, with masculinity. And, and that's, you know, obviously ridiculous, but it, it's one of the ways in which in which male supremacy and misogyny are, are, are really dangerous to everyone, including men. Uh, Maybe we need to replace the concept of masculinity with the concept of humanity. You yeah. Know, people, you know, because this whole, I mean, how can you be, um, you know, uh, a macho man and disregard the safety of other people? Mm -hmm. Seems to me like that's a contradiction in terms, you know what I'm saying? And I think, and uh, I, I would bet that some of these people, these reopen protesters, are actually living that contradiction in a certain way, or a very similar one, because um, in their, I'm willing to bet that in their private lives, they behave, um, I, I think, in, in ways that are often that demonstrate a connectedness to other people and a humanity. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of guessing, I don't know any reopen protesters personally, but I know a lot of, of Trump voters. Um, and, you know, when, when something's going wrong, uh, somebody needs help or something, they're often the first to step in, the first to recognize, you know, that, that we need each other. But then you have this, distortion, twisting, abandonment of, of humanity in, in favor of, yeah, I, I don't get it, I guess is what I'm saying, you know. People... Yeah, well, some, they, they, you know, but they're using it, they get it. Uh, those who are um, prompting the, the pro uh, protesters and organizing it and financing it, that's a very dangerous game that they're uh, playing because the same thing uh, was done in the Weimar Republic uh, with Hitler. You know, they thought that they could control these armed gangs, mm -hmm. you know, and um, they lost control of it. And the result was, you know, 6 million Jews who died in the gas chamber. And I don't know how many disabled people and how many gypsies you know, and, and how many communists and socialists and ministers, religious people you died in the died in the, and 20 million Soviets mm -hmm. died on the Eastern Front, which bore the main brunt of that terrible, terrible uh, war. So that's a dangerous 
very dangerous game that they're playing. <clears throat> but the danger is even bigger. Because if you think about the social impact of the crisis here in the United States, you know, um, and the fact that it's mainly people of color who are dying, frontline workers who are dying, you know, um, it's a, it's a, you gotta think about that because think about what's happening on the uh, Native American uh, 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 nation uh, territories, you know, highest death rate. Think about what's happening in the African American and Latino uh, communities. You know, three times as likely uh, to die. I read this morning, three times, you're three times as likely to know someone who died. Uh, a brother I just went to school with died COVID this week, you know? Um, and uh, I think uh, he's the second person, actually he's the first person who I knew directly from Youngstown, but the second person I knew by one degree of separation, right. you know, who passed away. So, um, you know, and it was, it was Paul Robeson and William Patterson who made the point in the genocide petition, which they brought to the United Nations. You know about that, right? We charge yeah. genocide. And Pat made the point that, you know, if a government knows the implications of its policies and does nothing about it, it's genocidal. It's, and it's, it's not even, it's not even a, 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 a passive refusal to do something. There, it, there's an actual intensification in some cases of, of the, the assault on, um, on people of color. The, uh, the, the closure of the border, the, um, uh, the deportations, the, like those, those are continuing and, that, and increasing, in fact. Um, so this is, with, with, the, with, the, the, with, with undocumented people also being locked out of any of the relief bills, this is a, I, I, I think we have to start thinking in terms similar to the, to the We Charge Genocide um, uh, petition, because this is, it's, it's, it's mass, deliberate mass slaughter of, of huge sections of the American people. And they, don't, and they just don't care, which is part of the reason behind, it's not spoken, this go to work, yeah. uh, protesting to stay at home. It ain't affecting me. You know, I'm going to develop herd immunity. And by the way, this herd immunity thing, what, what I've been reading the last week or so is that it's unproven. Like for example, I mean, it's unproven that once you catch the virus, that you won't catch it a second time, but you'll become immune to it. And I was reading that like Sweden has yeah. uh, had a, policy, they're just ignoring, well, they're not ignoring, but they have very loose, you can kind of basically kind of do what you want to do, it's your thing. And um, only, what was it, 17% of the people who they tested have antibodies for the virus. They thought it was going to be like around 30% or something like that, but it was much, much, much smaller. And then you don't know if those people who have the antibodies have enough in order to fight the virus. I saw in China, um, I think it was uh, a very small percentage of the people, I think it was 30, uh, had the antibodies, but they were not enough to combat the virus. Yeah. This and, virus is a monster, man. And we, we, don't, even, we don't even have enough of the, uh, I think an antibody test has been approved, but there's, there's not enough of it to even test in a meaningful way for that. So, yeah. And the difference with Sweden has, you know, it's, its policy was not as effective as it thought. Um, but at least Sweden has a, a, a national healthcare system that provides good coverage, right? So if people do get sick, they're, they're not locked out of, uh, of getting treatment for it. Unlike here, like, I mean, it, it, not so here. Mm -hmm. This seems very typical of, of, of Trump's approach to things that he finds disagreeable or offensive, which is to try and just um, erase them, lock them away, get them out of sight, 
right? That was the homeless in, in um, Los Angeles. Oh, we got to get them off the streets. We got, this is a blight, it's a whatever. Like he just, the, the solution is never, how do we address the problem? It's always just um, either deport somebody, lock somebody up, shuffle somebody off somewhere else. It's like, you have to, it's like making America great is just making things, dis making anything I don't like disappear. And it, it's, it's yeah, we'd like for us to disappear, but uh, Mr. Trump, we ain't going nowhere. We ain't going nowhere. We're going to be all up in your face. Uh, we're going to push you out of office in November. By the way, his numbers are going down. Not that I trust these polls at all, you know, pay much attention to them. Uh, but they're going down, you know, they're like, he's eight, uh, even on Fox News, he's like eight percentage points down. He's lost support among seniors who really supported him last time. Yep. Um, um, he's got a plurality amongst men, uh, but women are saying, oh, hell no, we're not. Mm -mm. And that's a positive thing, but you can't take anything for granted now. Uh, in Pennsylvania, your home state where your homeboy is <laughs> presumptive nominee, in Scranton, in that uh, county, um, mm -hmm. Trump is losing now. Uh, and uh, so in that county, and then if you take the Philadelphia suburbs, uh, hello, you're in trouble. I wonder how he's doing in Pittsburgh um, uh, and in the surrounding uh, Yeah, that'd be uh, in 2018, right? That um, the, there was a legislative district there that, that flipped. Um, that yes, um, yes, yeah, just like in Ohio, where I'm from, you know. Trumbo County went for uh, uh, Trump. Narrowly, uh, which is right next to Youngstown, and where Warren is the major city there. Mahoney County went narrowly for Mrs. Clinton, but just narrowly. So, um, got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Can't take anything for granted. Um, but the major thing is, you know, what's going to happen after the election? You know, and I just wrote a piece, Scott. That'll be on the party website, and we encourage everybody to go to cpusa.org and check out the new articles. We've got a lot of new stuff up this week. We should talk about it. But I just wrote a piece based on two interviews that I heard. One with uh, 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 Mr. Summers, Larry Summers, the former president of Harvard and um, economist. I think he was the secretary of the treasury for a minute, too. But he was the head of the council, economic Obama's economic council. Anyway, it was an inter and, and then Mr. Stiglitz, the Nobel mm -hmm. Prize winning uh, economist at Columbia. So Summers was like, you know, um, I'm in favor of unemployment compensation. We need to be very generous with uh, that. But when it comes to, for example, these proposals to uh, for pay tech protection. Mm -hmm. Uh, subsidizing the corporations up to like 80% or something. Uh, he said, oh, hell no. No, absolutely not. That's a bad idea. Some of these companies are going under and we got to let the market do its thing. He said, what sense does it make for Delta Airlines to keep all of its employees up through October 1st when they're not going to need this number of employees for years to come? I wonder how the Airline Workers Union feels about that, you know? It's a hard situation um, because, you know, on the one hand, it's tempting to agree, yeah, you know, fuck Delta Air, sorry, um, <laughs> for Delta Airlines. Uh, but, you know, these are- these you said are, it, not me. Yeah. Um, these are, this is the fate of, of workers and, and their families and, you know, when it comes down to it, if this is the only way of making sure they can continue to to have a livelihood, then yeah, the, the, we can't just throw people to the mercy of the market. Um, and Stiglitz was saying that there's a big push now to, uh, there's a big skepticism about uh, just-in-time production, the production of mm -hmm. factory goods or parts in other countries because of what happened and the ongoing problems with this virus. So there's a push to return production to the United States. Good, right? Mm -hmm. Not necessarily, 
because he says that most of these factories now are going to be utilizing robots instead of people. So it's not necessarily going to result in an increase in domestic jobs. This, this so there's a trend towards, towards deindustrialization and a service economy are going to continue. That, but that's not, that's not, well, it's like Mark says, like bourgeois economists think that there are these overriding natural laws that govern how the economy works. The economy is the result of actual decisions made by the owners of the means of production um, under certain political conditions. So mm. we have like the question of whether automation is going to serve the capitalist class or serve the people is a political decision and it's the it's an object of struggle right but it's also a decision which is based on um the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall and in order for capital to maintain its rate of profit it has to take up take take certain measures they're kind of compelled to yeah no that, that is that is that is true but the um in, in the specific question, uh, whether the uh, re whether whether moving production back to the United States uh, results in further job loss is not, you know, again it, it, it can be it can be fought over it can be struggled over. Um, it's going to happen. That's the whole point of my article because you're absolutely right because these neoliberals who are advising the incoming administration are basically arguing that the crisis is going to be solved on the backs of working class people. No. I That's mean, good. they're speaking with, on both sides of their mouth, actually. On the one side, they're saying, oh, yeah, let's give them unemployment. That's really, but on the other side, they're saying that there's going to be a dramatic restructuring of the economy. Hello, mm -hmm. and you better get ready for it. You know, you better get ready for it. And um, because, hey, it's out of our hands. I mean, it's not profitable. This sounds like wishful thinking to me, right? We know that this, like time and again, Thinking. these neoliberal policy ideas have failed. They've been failing spectacularly since 2008. And failing for who, Scott? Failing for- For, for, for increasing- Increasingly broad sections Selling of for Microsoft. No, oh. but for the for the people who, um, at least in in some degree, have to uh, give their their support to the politicians who implement them, and like there, there's a political crisis of that whole neoliberal project, right? And um, so they're they're just saying, oh no. Again, these these same old tired neoliberal ideas are the only way forward. We just have to. No, it's nonsense. It's well, uh, whether or not it will be nonsense will be de determined on the political ba battlefield and the period after the election, because there's going to be a big, big, big fight. I mean, you know, you got these planks that are being put forward in the Democratic Party for uh, uh, alleviating uh, student debt, for uh, taxing the rich, for a, uh, a uh, sustainable green infrastructure bill. They don't want to call it the Green New Deal. OK, whatever. Uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that is going to um, confront the reality of the economic policy decision makers on Wall Street, who, by the way, are not elected by anybody. You know, I can remember uh, Bill Clinton in his first term, you know, was trying to put forward uh, these different, I think it was a, his wife's, Mrs. Clinton's yeah. healthcare bill or something like that. And he uh, got really angry and he said, do you mean to tell me that my whole fucking administration is gonna be based on the decision of a bunch of, and he said it again, fucking bond traders. And, and, and what ended up what happened? Yeah. Goldman Sachs, y'all, came in there and they've been running uh, and helping run every administration since then, you know? And that's the school 
that that's the stable that summers, summers you know, comes right. out of and all of and all of the rest of them. So y'all, we got to be prepared to fight. And fight. I think that that's one um, arena, big arena of struggle after the elections. The other is, um, I think e you know, even if we we have a, a sort of resounding electoral victory, we get rid of Trump, we take back the Senate, we flip a bunch more state houses. Um, that's still, I'm working on an article right now about what is a decisive defeat of the extreme right? Like what would, what would it look like? Um, and that is gonna be an ongoing struggle as well to, um, to uh, the way Lenin thought of it, that struggle culminated in a democratic republic based on real universal suff suffrage with real equal political rights for everyone. Um, and to do that, you need to be able to take action against these organizations, uh, the propaganda machine that are um, stirring up this extreme right armed, you know, fascist. Well, what are you going to do about the freedom of speech, Scott? By the way, you, you, you lived in France for some time. Mm -hmm. You know that in France, it's against the law to promote fascist ideas, Nazi ideas. We can, you know, they in, don't in go. To some degree, it's Holocaust denial specifically. Holocaust yes. denial is against the law. But the U.S. It, understanding of the First Amendment rights are different, and you so can't. US, so how are you gonna? How are you gonna handle way, that kind of situation? The way I I see the distinction is um, the First Amendment applies to individuals, not to corporate entities, right? Some you know somebody wants to go out and you know promote carry a swastika, promote whatever, do it. Um, I mean, it's stupid, but um, the fact that Fox News, because uh, I think it was Reagan who relaxed the um, uh, regulations regarding uh, telecommunications, Fox News is allowed to present itself as a news network rather than a propaganda machine. Um, or the NRA or these huge... Um, these concentrations of resources that are poured in to doing the ideological work of fascism, that I do not see as protected by the freedom of speech. That's, freedom of speech is speech, it's not money, it's not uh, corporations, it's not. That's an important point. And the other thing is, is that you gotta take initiative when you're fighting this racism. You just can't let it go by. We had an interesting question in the discord last night. You know, what do whites need to do in order to, to fight a, a racism? And uh, we had a little bit of a, a conversation about it. And the thing that I said is that you just can't let it go. You got to take initiative, you know? And too often people just let it pay. Oh, you're not going to change him. You know, he's or she's, you know, um, yeah. They're just lost, you know. They're what's that word? Incorrigible or something like that. Incorrigible. Incorrigible. And 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 um, and they're true. It's true. There's some people who are like that, you know. But it's important for people. I read it. It was a, one of our comrades was in I think New Hampshire the other day with his wife. A woman and her husband came in. And they were wearing Confederate flag, you know. So he was like outraged, and he said, "Yo, step to him," and he said. Uh, what don't you know what that flag represents? You know, mm -hmm. hello, and you can imagine what he he said. But what angered him the most was that nobody in the store said anything. Mm -hmm. Everybody was quiet, you know, and that made him livid, livid. And I can understand why, you know. Um, but that's not always the 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 reaction. I told another story that uh, years ago, here in the city, I was on the subway and there was this white dude in the car, standing by the door and he was preaching. You know, you can see everything in the New York subway. Songs, music, people panhandling, preaching, whatever. Some things I won't even mention um, <laughs> on a public show. But I was listening to this cat, right? And he was uh, making, it was a racist sermon talking about 
Black and Puerto Rican youth carrying around these uh, boom boxes, you know, calling them jungle boxes, playing jungle music. And when I first heard it, I lost him. I lost it completely. I called that son of a gun everything but a child of God. Mm -hmm. But when I did, the whites in the subway car chased him out. Get out of here, you bigot. You Nazi. Mm -hmm. You Ku Kluxer. And, and, and the boy <laughs> picked up his shit and left, you know. Now, I wish it was a white person that had said it instead of me. But the point being that you got to speak up, you got to speak out, you know, and, and, and when you do that, people respond. And that's and the something uh, that the party has said for a long time, right? That, that Say what? This is something the party has said for a long time, that white people have a, uh, white workers in particular, have a special role in the fight against racism. Um, yeah. uh, the, the, the duty to confront um, other white people when they're, they're, they're spreading this. This bullshit. As do men in the fight for the, in general, in the fight against male supremacy. Mm -hmm. We carry it. But we have to combat it. Well, um, particularly now in this moment uh, with the uh, growing heightened awareness of the fight against sexism and uh, male supremacy, all of these isms that degrade people need to be combated in a rigorous uh, way. Well, we're over time, <laughs> um, Scott. So I want to wish you a good weekend. Same I want to wish all our viewers stay healthy and uh, safe, physically distant, but socially close. And we'll see you next week. Take care. Take care.